Shalom. Welcome to the vidcast series from Light of Menorah that's entitled Hanukkah, the Return of the King. We've had a number of videos already. The first one, Hanukkah, Return of the King, Introduction. Then Hanukkah, Return of the King, Candle 1. And then Candle 2, Candle 3. All the way up to Candle 7. Going along with the candles on the Hanukkah menorah. And this, is this video is the video associated with Candle 8. And as I normally do in this Hanukkah series, The Return of the King, I like to do a blessing. A blessing like they would have done in Jesus' day. A blessing before we get into the Word of God. Once again, I'll do the blessing in Hebrew. And I'll read it slowly so that you can repeat after me. And then we could do it together in English. Baruch Ata Aronai. Eloheinu Melech Haholam. Ashir Bakar Banu. Mikol Hachamim. Vina Tanlanu Etoroto. Vinevuim Ha Tovim. Vina Tanlanu Et Habasora Mashiach Yeshua. Vina Tanlanu Et Habrit Chadash. Baruch Ata Aronai. No ten, a devere, amen. And in English, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and given us his Torah and the good prophets and given us the good news of Messiah Jesus, given us the new covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the words of truth. If you are watching this video, and it's the first video, in this vidcast series that you're watching, I strongly suggest that you go back and start at the beginning. All of these are dependent upon each other. This one, eight, is dependent on the fact that seven, you watch seven, and seven is dependent on six. So if you go to the website, you'll find a search window. And there at the search window, it'll be obvious, it'll be right on your right-hand side, you can type in the word Hanukkah, and I spell it using the traditional spelling, C-H-A-N-U-K-A-H, C-H-A-N-U-K-A-H, and click your return key or your mouse or whatever, and it will bring up all of the Hanukkah, Hanukkah videos. Uh, they're in reverse order. So if you did that, the latest one will be right there on top. And the first one, the introduction, will be uh, way down at the bottom. So you'll have to slide down to get to the introduction. But like I said, if this is your first time, I really recommend that you go back to the introduction and work your way back up and come back up here so that you can get the full impact of this lesson, which is unbelievably amazing, just unbelievably amazing. I am so amazed. I, I, I really am when we come to this lesson. Amazed how Jesus uses Hanukkah there at the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24 to teach his disciples about his return. And it's something that I have said before, we don't get it, we Christians in the 21st century. As a Christian, I, like I said, I'm amazed. I have never heard this until I put the Bible into its historical context, until I really got trained in Bible history. It's just amazing. And on top of that, Jesus not only teaches about his return using Hanukkah as a picture, he also talks about who he is. It's, it's amazing that how we're going to see, we're going to see it again in this video, that Jesus uses Hanukkah, the events of Hanukkah, to describe even who he is. But amazingly enough, the Lord did it before. He actually connected the events of Hanukkah before the events of Hanukkah. 
nearly 400 years before the events of Hanukkah. He predicted not only the events that were going to be coming up of the days of the Maccabees, the events of the first Hanukkah, but at the same time, before Hanukkah, 400 years before Hanukkah, the first Hanukkah, he also predicted his return and the end of the age. He told us 400 years ago about the days of Judah the Maccabee and about the end times. Uh, this is this has gone beyond what we see with regards to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24. The Lord uses Hanukkah in Matthew 24, and we're going to see that he inspires one of his chosen. One of his chosen to tell us about the end times, about Hanukkah. And about the return of the king. This is too amazing. And this is not the last video. Definitely we're on the eighth candle. There is a concluding video. That will be talking about the central candle. The candle, the serpent candle, the shamash candle. The central candle of the Hanukkah menorah. And it will take us back to remember the birth of the king. We're remembering the return of the king. And we're going to see how all of this helps us understand the birth of the king, the coming of the king the first time. So you ready? Let's go see. We're taking a look at an artist's rendering of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. They're seated on his throne. And those of you that have watched the videos, we've talked about Hannah and her seven sons. And this is supposedly that scene that the artist is painting. You can see the youngest son there. Just to the left of the king and his mom right behind him. Anyway, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, a coin says that he is God. This is a coin that was minted during the days of the Maccabees, and the Greek inscription on the flip side of the coin says, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearer of victory. So not only did Antiochus IV Epiphanes declare that he was God verbally, but he also had it on his coins. We know already that he made the practice of Judaism illegal in Israel. Mothers were brutally tortured and killed because they circumcised their sons. We remember our hero, Eleazar, who would not eat a piece of bacon. And then on top of that, his friend said, hey, we're, we substituted a piece of beef so you can do this to preserve your own life. And he wouldn't do it because he did not want to give the impression to young people that he had sold out and thus perhaps forced those young people to lose their faith. This is what Antiochus IV Epiphanes did. He made the practice of Judaism illegal. He wanted all the Jews to become pagan Hellenists like himself. Many devout Jews were martyred. But as time passed, Antiochus IV was on a military campaign in the Iran-Iraq area. And he had heard of Judah's victories. He had heard of the capture of Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple. He was furious when he heard this. And he decided that he was going to go back to kill all the Jews. However, God had another plan. Let's take a look. He became furious, Antiochus and decided to make the Jews pay for the defeat he had suffered. So he ordered his chariot driver not to stop until they reached Jerusalem. With great arrogance, he said, I will turn Jerusalem into a graveyard full of Jews. But he did not know that he was heading straight for God's judgment. In fact, 
as soon as he had said these words, the all-seeing Lord, the God of Israel, struck him down with an invisible but fatal blow. He was seized with sharp intestinal pains for which there was no relief, a fitting punishment for the man who had tortured others in so many terrible ways. But this is no, but this in no way caused him to give up his pride. Instead, he became more arrogant than ever, and breathing out fiery threats against the Jews, he gave orders to drive them even faster. As a result, he fell out of his chariot with such a thud that it made every bone in his body ache. His arrogant pride made him think he had the superhuman strength to make ocean waves obey him and to obey and to weigh high mountains on a pair of scales. But suddenly he fell flat on the ground and had to be carried off on a stretcher, a clear sign to everyone of God's power. And again, here's an artist rendering of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, struck down by the hand of God in his chariot and falling on the ground. Even the eyes of the godless man were crawling, and, and even the eyes of the godless man were crawling with worms, and he lived in terrible pain and agony. The stink was so bad that his entire army was sickened, and no one was able to come close enough to carry him around. Yet only a short while before, he thought he could take hold of the stars. And so this murderer who had cursed God suffered the same terrible agonies he had brought on others and then died a miserable death in the mountains of a foreign land. One of his close friends, Philip, took his body home, but because he was afraid of Antiochus' son, he went on to King Ptolemy Philomitor of Egypt. And all of this is in 2 Maccabees chapter 9. He was anti-God, anti-Bible, and anti-Israel. He thought he was powerful, the Almighty, he was vicious and cruel as well. But he was defeated by the God of Abraham. And God picked a simple priest. A simple priest in Modin and his son. In his power to defeat the mighty Greek king Antiochus IV Epiphanes. This is a picture of Jesus from Revelation 19, coming on a white horse and attacking the beast. The beast that we know of as the Antichrist. You can see him in the lower right-hand corner. You can see his mouth open like the mouth of a lion. And the beast is definitely a picture of the Antichrist. Revelation 13, he had a mouth like a lion. And we know that he persecutes the saints. Antiochus IV Epiphanes is a picture of the beast. God uses Hanukkah in Daniel 8 and 11 to tell of the end times. I'm looking at the Archaeological Study Bible, the ESV version, and this is from Crossway Publishers. And the Bible scholars here point out in Daniel chapter 8, starting in verse 9, it says, Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. Now, there's some comments here among the scholars, and they say the little horn in Daniel 8, verses 9 through 14, is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And we know Antiochus IV Epiphanes is the villain of the Hanukkah story. This Seleucid leader desecrated the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and stopped the regular burnt offering. So when we look at Daniel chapter 8 from the historical perspective, it's clear that in Daniel 8, the days of Hanukkah, the evil king and villain of Hanukkah, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, is pictured here. Daniel wrote this in 600 BC. 
the events of Hanukkah happened basically 170 to 164 BC, roughly some 400 years before the events. Daniel is used by God to predict the events. Then we go to 11. When you read in Daniel chapter 11, most of it is the war between the Seleucid Greeks and the Ptolemy Greeks. These were two kings. They were two generals of Alexander the Great when he died, and they separated the kingdom actually in four parts. There's four generals. And the Seleucids and the Ptolemies fought each other, and Seleuc the Seleucids finally defeated the Ptolemies and took over Israel. And that all of chapter 11 is that in detail. Now, starting in verse 21, we read, In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without a warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully and he shall become strong with a small people. We shall, without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his fathers or his father's fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. At any rate, it goes on. And this is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And again, this is Hanukkah. This is the story of Hanukkah. Now, when you're studying the end times, something happens in Daniel chapter 11. And in Daniel chapter 11, we go to verse 40, and we see something interesting is the wording. All of this is about Antiochus IV Epiphanes. All of this is about the abomination of desolation, about the times of the first Hanukkah. But then we read in verse 40, at the time of the end... The king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon, rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. As the scholars are talking or commenting in the archaeological study Bible, they're saying there's an automatic shift where is God is using the picture of Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes to talk about the end times. <sighs> I thought Jesus was the only one using Hanukkah to talk about the return of the king. Jesus, perhaps, was reminding his disciples in Matthew 24 of the book of Daniel. Antiochus says he's God. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, Paul writes about the Antichrist, who says he's God. Amazing connections. But God says he's chosen to defeat the beasts. We see Judas the Maccabee defeating the first beast, Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. But this is all also a picture, a reminder for us that there is his chosen, Yeshua, King of kings and Lord of lords, to come against and defeat the beast, the final beast in the end times. Judah the Maccabee, he died in about 160 BC. Things didn't go well even after the Hanukkah event. And in the book of Maccabees, somebody, the author wrote a beautiful eulogy about Judah the Maccabee. And we read, and he got his people great honor and put on a breastplate as a giant, and girt his warlike armor about him in battles, and protected the camp with the sword. In his acts, he was like a lion, and like a lion's whelp roaring for his prey. This is important. I want you to recall that the book, the book of Revelation, Revelation 13 said, the beast, the Antichrist, has a mouth like a lion. Here, we're reading about Judah the Maccabee, this eulogy. In his acts, he was like a lion, and like a lion's whelp roaring for his prey. And he pursued the wicked and sought them out, 
And them that troubled his people, he burnt with fire. And his enemies were driven away for fear of him. And all the workers of iniquity were troubled. And salvation prospered in his hand. And he grieved many kings and made Jacob glad with his works. And remember, Jacob, another name for Jacob is Israel. So you can read that. And he made many kings and made Israel glad with his works. And his memory is blessed forever. And he went through the cities of Judah and destroyed the wicked out of them and turned away wrath from Israel. And he was renowned even to the utmost part of the earth, and he gathered them that were perishing. Judas is a lion fighting in Judah. He is a lion fighting in Judah. The Antichrist, Revelation 13, the beast has a face like a lion. A mouth like a lion. And then we read this in Revelation 5.5. 5. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Jesus is the lion from Judah. Judas the Maccabee is the lion who fought through Judah. And the most remarkable thing of all is Jacob, years and years and years before this, was prophesying over his 12 sons. And here is part of the prophecy over his son Judah. Wait till you read this from the Torah. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You hold your enemies by the neck. Your brothers will bow down before you. Judah is like a lion. Killing his victim and returning to his den, stretching out and lying down. No one dares disturb him. Judah will hold the royal scepter and his descendants will always rule. Nations will bring him tribute and bow in obedience before him. This is a messianic prophecy in the Torah. The king will be like a lion. And Jesus is the lion of Judah. The Hanukkah menorah is now fully lit. And the eighth candle is to remind us that Yeshua is ha Arye. He is the lion. The lion of Judah. So let us say the blessing. Baruch atah Aronai. Eloheinu melech haholam. Ashir kitchenu bimitzvotav. Veina tan lanu Yeshua. Adonenu, Mashienu, Hahor, Haholam. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God and King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and given us Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, the light of the world. The light of the world. Hanukkah, the festival of light, the festival of the lights. And all the candles testify that he is coming again. The return of the king. And may our King, our Lord, our Savior, bless you with his amazing shalom.